clearly Brazil deserving of the win. Uh, let's welcome Gab Marcotti to the show. Gab, on paper, you might look at this and think, oh, nice. 3 0, good start. Brazil will be happy. Use that as a stepping stone to go forward. But if you saw the match, and in particular that opening 45 minutes, they were absolutely dreadful. And that has got to be concern for a team, let's not forget, who are favourites to win this tournament. Yeah, I think so. I mean, look, you can give reasons for it, right? Bolivia were, were only out there uh, to defend, and rightly so, in, in the first half. I think. Uh, uh, there, there were probably some nerves, a little bit of stage fright. Uh, I think certainly the decision to play Casemiro plus Fernandinho uh, didn't really help uh, in terms of creativity, unlocking things uh, in midfield. You know, two hold, essentially defensive midfielders against Bolivia. Probably overkill, throw in the fact that, you know, you've got some goal scoring issues there with uh, Jesus is on the bench. You've, Roberto Firmino up front, wonderful player, but not exactly a, a prolific goal scorer. With him, David Neres, also not a great uh, prolific goal scorer and very young. Mm. Um, so I think all those things uh, certainly coming together, maybe maybe a bit of a lack of leadership as well in the final third. But you know, I think you can see that this is the kind of tournament the Copa America is. It gets nervy and a goal will often unlock things. How much of a problem Brazil is Brazil, Chaka? Because you look at this starting 11 here, and compared to the teams that we grew up with, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't even compare. No, no, it doesn't. And, and I, I think Brazil's biggest names and, and, and best players are defensive ones, especially when you consider form coming into this tournament. And as much as, as you may question the, the inclusion of the two, the two defensive midfielders for Brazil, I think that's with a thought of later on in, in the tournament, as opposed to Bolivia, the lowest ranked team uh, in, in common ball. But still, huge question marks about that front four, as it were. It's a big summer for Coutinho, for, for club reasons as, as much as anything. And I think he will have to be Brazil's leading scorer if they are to go deep in this tournament. David Neres, will, will, he, will play, he will play wide. Uh, Firmino, who, as good as he's been for, for Liverpool, um, his numbers aren't anywhere near as good in, in a Brazil shoot. So there's a lot going to be asked of uh, Philippe Coutinho, who's struggled at times uh, for Barcelona over the last couple of seasons. Gap, there were some, weren't there, making the point, hey, maybe this Brazil side will be better off without Neymar, without the distraction, without the circus that surrounds him. But I'll tell you what, you looked at the players out there on the pitch last night, and you're kind of thinking, well, who's going to provide any sort of spark to kick this team into gear? I'm not quite as negative as you are, Dan, uh, <laughs> about this. I mean, A, you have to compare it to the rest of the tournament. But secondly, you know, you're talking about Firmino, who's center forward of a very prolific attack, often as a, as a provider um, for, for the European champions and the teams that finished 97 with 97 points in, in the Premier League. You know, Coutinho, I agree, it's a huge tournament for him. He's got a chance to turn it around. I wonder if in a tournament like this, maybe guys like, like, like Neres and Richarlison actually give you an extra level of motivation that you might not have uh, with other players. Obviously, you've got Gabriel Jesus still to come, um, and you have a really, really good defense. Um, you know, a really uh, expert, wily defense, good for this kind of tournament, and an outstanding goalkeeper. So you put those those factors together, the, the ingredients are there. Uh, do you necessarily have the, the exciting, creative, deep-lying midfielder yeah. we once had with Brazil? Certainly not. Well, what's interesting, Gab, and I've obviously got a big Brazilian family, and I speak to them a lot about this team coming into this tournament. It's a real almost apathy about it all. There, there seems to be a real lack of excitement where you think maybe, and I say some, but yeah, but you've got some young, exciting players coming through, but they don't seem to be jumping quite on that bandwagon yet. But I suppose as the tournament goes on, that may increase when they put in better performances. Difficult to gauge, I suppose, as you say, from that opening match against a Bolivian side that sat in. But that opening 45 minutes was really tough viewing. I, I certainly hope you're right, Dan. Uh, and, and that's something that I think was, was quite noticeable, you know, even from... I'm, I'm here in London now. I'll be, I'll be heading out uh, to, to, to Brazil towards the end of the group stage, and I hope it picks up. And we saw a little bit, um, you know, in the, uh, uh, in, in, in the other game, the, the, the Venezuela-Peru game, obviously, you know, Brazil not involved there, but uh, a lot of empty seats in, in Porto Alegre uh, as well. And, you know, you contrast that with uh, 
uh, the last sort of proper Copa America in, in Chile in, in 2015. And it certainly felt different. Maybe it was a smaller stadiums, uh, whatever it was. Um, but I think it's pretty obvious this, this competition really hasn't yet kickstarted mm. yet. It hasn't gotten into full flow. And hopefully that, that'll happen very soon. For more, sign up now for ESPN+. Plus.